Sometimes when you sit down and close your eyes, you're right here with the breath. There are not too many other things impinging on the mind. You find it easy to let them go. And there it is, the breath coming in, going out. You can watch it for a while to gain a sense of its many ins and outs. In other words, the different layers of energy that are flowing here. The way you relate to your body right now. See if you can put aside a lot of your preconceived notions about what's happening with the breathing and notice how it actually feels. When there's an impulse to breathe in, where do you feel it first? And how does it spread through the rest of the body? Try to get in touch with the felt experience of the breath as much as you can. And then rearrange your perceptions around that. So it feels like the breath begins in the navel. Okay, focus on its beginning in the navel. You don't have to think about the, the air coming in and out of the nose. If it feels like it's coming from around the area of the heart, think of that's what's happening. Breath energy is flowing from the heart. Or you may have your own spots. I found that for some reason the area right at the outside of the pelvis on either side seems to be a, an important area. If that gets calmed down, then the whole rest of the body gets calmed down. So each of us has our own patterns of energy flow. And as you get to them, you know them, you may begin to realize that some of them are good for the body and others are not. We have a repertoire of different ways of relating to the breath. But if that's too complex to think about right now, just say, okay, how do you feel the breath? Try to stay with that sensation as much as you can. There are other times, though, when you sit down to be with the breath and the mind just doesn't stay with the breath at all. It's like taking an inflated ball and trying to keep it underwater. As soon as your grasp on the ball gets loosened a little bit, it comes shooting up out of the water. That's a sign that the mind needs to be put in the right mood. And instead of working directly with the breath, you work with it indirectly by choosing what the Buddha says, an inspiring theme. Something you like to think about that is related to the Dharma, related to your practice of the Dharma. And as you think about it and the mind gets calmed down, gets put in a better mood, the breath will change. So you work with the breath either directly by focusing on it or indirectly by putting the mind in the right mood. And John Swat talks about this a lot. He said, you sit down to meditate and you've got to get the mind in that proper frame to do the meditation with a sense of inspiration that this is something really good. And you want the topic that inspires you to be related to the Dharma. So it doesn't send you off away from the present moment, but it actually brings you back. For instance, he talks about taking the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha as objects of recollection. You can think about the life story of the Buddha and focus on the details that you find inspiring. Whether it's, whether it's the fact that he gave up all of his power and wealth, or that he was kind to people of all kinds. There's that great story where there's an outcast who sees the Buddha coming down the street, and as an outcast, he has to get out of the way. So he scrunches himself up in the wall on the side of the sidewalk there. Well, they would probably say to have a sidewalk at the side of the road as much as possible. And the Buddha stops in front of him and he scrunches himself up some more for fear that the Buddha is going to take offense at him. And instead, the Buddha wants to teach him. Then after being taught by the Buddha, he goes and practices and becomes an arahant. 
fact that the Buddha didn't overlook him. You might find that inspiring. I do. Or he might be inspired by the, the time when after he'd been practicing austerities for six long years, he got to the point where he realized that no one ever had ever endured more extreme austerities than he had at that point. Now, some people would take that as a point of pride, but he said, no, it wasn't working. And he was willing to put aside any pride that had kept him going with the austerities and ask himself, is there another way? So lots of incidents in the Buddha's life story that you can take as inspiration. The same with the Sangha. You read the, the poems and the Taragata and the Tarigata. In some cases, they're a lot more approachable than the Buddha was, in the sense of you can imagine yourself in their place more than you can in his, because they talk about a lot of the anguish they went through, and the troubles, and the disappointments, and the frustration they had with their practice. And then they were able to get around it. You tell yourself, okay, if they did it, so can I. As with the Buddha, you tell yourself, okay, what was, what was it that made him special? It was because he kept looking at his actions, looking at the state of his mind, and asking himself what he could do different, which is not all that different from what we're doing now. So this is how the reflection, once it calms you down, gets you focused back in on the breath, back in the present moment, because this is where the Buddha gained his awakening, focusing on the breath. Same with the members of the Sangha. How do they overcome their frustration? By finally sitting down and being willing to look at their minds and give up whatever it was that was hanging over them or pulling them back. Is this kind of thinking brings you back to the present moment. I might think about the Dharma. What is, what is in the Dharma that you find inspiring? What particular teaching do you find inspiring? You might run that through your mind for a while. When you run across something that provides a good perspective on some of the problems you've been having in the course of the day or some of your issues that you bring to the practice, it helps you to see these things in a different light so the issues don't seem so large. And you find it easier to put them aside, and you're back with a breath. Three other topics the Buddha recommends. Recollection of generosity, recollection of virtue, and recollection of the devas. In terms of the generosity and virtue, you think about times when you have been generous and have been virtuous, i.e. times when you gave something not because you had to or because it was the custom or because it was expected, but simply you wanted to. And you think of the good that came from that. At the same time, you realize that this is a, you're probably your first experience of what it's like to feel free. In other words, you're not being driven by your selfishness. You're not being driven by your worries and concerns, or by the sense that you have to give. This is one of the really nicest things about the Buddhist sense of generosity, is that generosity is free. There are no shoulds around generosity. You give where you feel inspired. A lot of people lose sight of that. They say that as Buddhists we have to do this, we have to help, help here, have to help there, that it's somehow our moral obligation. Well, the Buddha was not in a position to place moral obligations on people. He was simply pointing out that this is the way things work. And he did everything he could to protect the freedom of generosity. When monks are asked, where should I give this? They're supposed to answer, give wherever you feel inspired, you feel it would be good used, <coughs> feel it would be well used, or people would take good care of it. That's it. And even under the issue of what we call social action, that comes under the air of generosity. That too is a free gift. You can decide whether you feel inspired or not. 
So giving is an act of freedom. Of course, you look at your life, if you have only one or two instances where you gave something because you really felt like it, it's hard to milk those one or two instances for a really good feeling that you can then take back into the meditation. So this means that you look at your life, where are other areas where you can be more generous? In other words, keep your stories of generosity fresh. You don't have to refer way back to incidents years ago. And with virtue, it's a similar sort of thing. You realize there are times when you could have done something, you could have gotten away with something that wasn't quite honest or wasn't quite above board or was actually harmful to yourself or other people, but you didn't do it out of a sense of principle. That sense of honor is an important thing. It provides an awful lot of nourishment for the mind. I was reading a while back, there was a book on honor. It was largely the old southern sense of honor that if somebody insulted you or your relatives, you're going to have to come and kill them. That kind of honor is, is really dumb. Here we're talking about the honor that comes from refraining from harm. That's something that really is honorable and noble. These words have kind of disappeared from our society, so it's good to revive them and get some nourishment from them. To can reflect on the fact that you have principles and you hold by them. That gives you some nourishment, that gives you some encouragement. It gives you a real basis for self-esteem, not the kind of floating around self-esteem that they, when they put stars on your, on your test papers. It's the self-esteem that comes from knowing that you are basically a good person. You've got some good qualities in here. And you're acting on them. That calms the mind down. And how are you going to maintain that sense of honor? How are you going to maintain that ability to be generous? Well, it depends on the strength of mind you develop. The best place to do that is right here. So the thinking brings you back. Even the recollection of the Davis is meant to bring you back to the breath. That's what it comes down to, is reflecting on the qualities that make people into Davis, the qualities that got Davis to where they are right now, enabled them when, back when they were human beings to take a birth as a Deva. The rewards that come from goodness, basically. And then you reflect on the fact that you have some of those qualities of goodness as well. In addition to generosity and virtue, there's a sense of conviction in the Buddha's awakening. Learning about the Dharma, developing your discernment, developing the attitudes of unlimited goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. These are the things that raise your level even while you're here as a human being. And again, where do they come from? And they come from the qualities you develop in the mind through meditation. So you can spread thoughts of goodwill for a while. This is why we have that chant every evening before the, the meditation, to remind ourselves of our motivation for being here. We want a happiness that's harmless, a happiness that doesn't harm anybody at all. Where are you going to find that? You have to look inside. If you want the power to be compassionate, where are you going to gain that so you don't burn out? We've got to look inside. So you can think about these topics for a while, and as you think about them in the right way, that brings you back around. In the meantime, as you've been thinking about topics that are soothing to the mind, uplifting to the mind, the way you breathe is going to change. You come back to the breath and you realize there's nothing much you have to do in terms of adjusting it anymore. It feels just right. So you settle down with that sense of ease in the body. And then try to maintain it. There's a Thai word, brakong, which means that you gently hold something. And sometimes you don't even hold it like a baby walking along, taking its first steps. You're right there, 
hovering around it to catch it if it falls, but not pulling it there because you want the child to learn how to walk. But you hover around it. So you want to hover around that good sense of breathing. And don't let your preconceived notions about breath get in the way. And this is one of the problems we have is we start focusing on the breath and all of a sudden things seize up because we have these preconceived notions. So even thinking about in-breath and out-breath, if that's a problem, just say quality of breath energy in the body. It flows in, flows out, there's no clear line between in and out. Okay, that's fine. In fact, the less of a clear line there is between an in and out breath, the easier it is to get the breath to calm down, settle in. And to fill the whole body. So you can either work at the breath by directing your thoughts to it, or you can work on the breath by directing your thoughts to something else that's calming, soothing, and brings you circling back to the breath. That's where those qualities of the day is. And where do they come from? They come from qualities you build in the mind. And where are you going to need to develop those qualities? Well, you need a lot of mindfulness and alertness. This is where you get at the breath. So as you sit down, take stock of where your mind is, where your breath is, and how they're getting along. And if you find that the mind can settle in the breath, with the breath right away, okay, go there. If not, give yourself some time to think your way into the proper mood. In this way you expand your repertoire as a meditator and develop a range of skills that you can apply to any situation. So that your proficiency in the meditation becomes more and more all around.